I'm joined today by Pastor James David Manning, who's the chief pastor at Atla World Missionary Church in Harlem here in New York City, just a few miles north of our studio. Pastor Manning has been uh, a strong critic, I think is even an understatement to say, of President Obama, uh, comparing President Obama to Satan, Hitler calling him a long-legged Mac Daddy. Pastor Manning, is your objection to President Obama primarily to him as a person or to his political views? Him as a person, uh, but surely because of his personhood, his political views are demented, uh, evil as well, but that stems from him as a person, so we'll let it rest there. Are you a political conservative? In other words, do you, when you say you disagree with President Obama on his views, is that because you're a, you're a conservative? No, I'm a Christian. I I, I wholeheartedly support the, the Word of God, the Bible, uh, and so I wouldn't necessarily call myself a conservative in that regard. A Christian point of view covers both the political and also the theological perspective. When you refer to President Obama as a long-legged Mac Daddy, this is something which has been turned into sort of a joke amongst many, but I've never actually heard you explain what, what that means. What, what exactly did you mean by that? It is both a spiritual and a social designation that is spot on for who he is as a person, personality. The term long-legged Mac Daddy derives from the street hood term of being a a daddy, young boys a few years ago uh, in their sexual encounter with young girls within the hood, uh, in the moment of the sexual experience will ask the young lady, who's your daddy? Uh, in and out of bed, that question was raised uh, and it made the man seem macho and the woman very submissive. The, the term Mac has as a term that has supplanted the term, the old term, the iceberg slim term of a pimp, which has a very negative connotation to it. The, so it's been supplanted by the word Mac. So when men who earn their living from putting women out on the street or otherwise uh, taking money from women for sexual favors uh, were then con considered Mac. Well, a Mac daddy is a person who professionally does that, does nothing else but that with women. And a long-legged Mac Daddy is the most successful pimp on planet Earth. And which uh, women? Which women has President Obama put out on the street? Well, you know the the ones that voted for him, the one that gave loads and loads of money and told tons and tons of lies and ran extreme interference on behalf of him. And all those old white women sitting up in the stadiums, 100,000, 200,000 strong uh, during the 2008 campaign, watching him speak and swooning over him, nothing more than the biggest pimp job I've ever seen. But are, can you name any of the ones that are now out on the street, as you say? Well, you know, the, the, the pimp game, as the term pimp uh, has been usurped by the term Mac, the pimp game doesn't run the streets anymore. It's a very sophisticated organ, sophisticated uh, kind of an, uh, an organization now where you call girls, you simply call up, or you can go to uh, the Gramercy list or somebody's list, and or you can go online. It's still pimping. I see. So, so Obama did it where it's like a high class uh pimping of sorts. He's there not literally go. icy. Hot tech pimping. Let's call it that. Okay. Uh, you talked about this Christian worldview that you have. And for people who don't know your background, you did, uh, you've admitted to, to breaking into as many as a hundred houses. You have threatened people with guns. You spent about three and a half years in prison and in prison is where you developed. You became a Christian, so to speak. What happened in prison that brought you to Jesus? First of all, I didn't threaten people with guns. I put a double barrel shotgun, sawed off shotgun, in the mouth of a low life, small time, if you will, mafiosa type person yeah. named Gaspar Zizzo. I put it in his mouth and threatened to blow his brains out. That's the only person on this planet I've ever threatened with a gun. So we need to be straight about that. Perfect. I don't know if I don't know if I broke into a hundred houses. I know over a period of about three or four years I went into a large number of them and stole things that I had no business stealing. And um, I regret to this very day that I lived that life. 
uh, there's not a day that goes by that I do not regret that. However, one of the things that happened to me while in prison, I turned around and looked at myself and said, what on earth am I doing here? How did I get here? Why did I turn out to be the kind of person that I turned out to be that would end up in prison? This is not my father's son. So I got down on my knees and I simply wanted uh, to be, uh, and I didn't fully understand, but I wanted the burden of how I had treated my family, how I embarrassed my school teachers and my parents. I wanted that burden lifted from me. And I, the only person I knew could do it was Jesus. He not only lifted that burden from me, but he saved me and it's changed my life dramatically. And how, how did you know to go to Jesus? And let me kind of contextualize that question. You go into prison and you recognize that you're you're on the wrong path. Like you said, you're not your father's son. Did you test out? Like, did you check with Allah? Did you check did. with with a, you know the God of Abraham and then Jesus and then the, the the God of the flying spaghetti monster? How did you ultimately settle on Jesus? I'm glad you raised that question because in prisons and during the 70s when I was there, the Islamic influence is still very powerful. Most men convert to Islam because it gives them a sense of being, protection, etc. And so I did. I did bow down to Allah twice in my cell on two consecutive nights, thinking that that would be bring what I needed. Hmm. Nothing happened when I prayed to Allah. But the very first night I prayed to Jesus, who was my grandmother's God and the God of my father and my uncles and aunts for many, many moons. When I prayed to him instantly, the power of God met me and I was changed. There's no doubt about it. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be talking to you today had I not been dramatically changed by the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting because in your political views, you've been very strongly uh, condemning homosexuality sexuality for for many years you've talked about uh, uh, gay people being stoned to death you've talked about sodomite slayers uh, you've talked about gay semen and Starbucks coffee but I want to put that conversation off a little bit are you what's your reaction to the reality that you want to see gays stoned to death and Isis wants to stone gays or they've even thrown gays off of the roofs of buildings are you comfortable sharing a view so precisely with an extremist Muslim group? Well, I got to tell you that uh, if my view does not come from ISIS or any other jihadist for that matter. No, no, no. I, now, let me let me clarify the question. I didn't suggest your views came from that. But what I'm saying is they happen to be identical. Well, yeah, and that's what I'm trying to say to you. I'm trying to tell you that my views come from the word of God, from the book of Leviticus, from the writings and teachings of Moses that says that every sodomite needs to be stoned to death. Not just sodomites, but adulterers as well. That's where my point of view comes from. So now, if it happens to be synonymous with ISIS or some other point of view, that's not my problem. My problem is to reverence the word of God, to trust it, to preach it, to teach it. And if the word says stone, then that's what it says. That is and no. But but so but so you admit that the the Christian doctrine you claim your views are informed by has led you to the exact same place that the the followers of ISIS have been led to by supposedly following Muslim doctrine. You recognize that wholeheartedly. No, I think what you're tr what you're failing to understand is you're trying to make what the Muslims do worse than what Moses has said do. In fact, any Christian, any true Christian, a follower of the word of God, were probably more extreme than ISIS or some of the other jihadists. When you look at the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and the things that he has said and, the, and has sanctioned, because Jesus said that whatever laws that Moses have put forward, including stoning, that he supports it wholeheartedly and all of heaven and earth would pass away before he would ever change one jot or one tittle of what Moses has said. So I think what many are trying to do is to say that ISIS is somehow or another worse than Christianity. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. The word of God is the word of God.
Let me remind the audience we're speaking with Pastor James David Manning. We're going to take a break on our TV and radio program and we'll continue speaking with Pastor Manning, including his claims about sodomite semen in Starbucks coffee. The full interview will be available on our YouTube channel. So let's go to that next, Pastor Manning. You've talked about how Starbucks uses gay semen in their coffee to make it taste good. Where did that come from? Well, I, I think you know that there was an article that was first promoted suggesting this idea and was then later retracted as just a hoax. Let me say something to you about marketing and about major corporations. No, but Start wait, let me pause because we have limited time with you and we talk a lot about marketing and corporations. I just want to know why you think that it would be specifically because gay semen true. in the coffee. Be, be, because it's true, because gays tend to love other each other's semen and it flavors up the coffee. They like the taste of it. There's no doubt about that. How do and you know that it flavors the coffee? Well, because that's what it does, like the cocaine that was put in Coca-Cola going back a century ago that flavored up Coca-Cola. And they now introduce, have introduced a synthetic cocaine that gives Coca-Cola the same kind of flavor and excitement and addiction of taste. Well, Starbucks has done the exact same thing that Coca-Cola has done, except they've done it with semen. But enlighten me on the logistics. So if I go into a Starbucks and I say I want a, you know, medium vanilla latte, BS, whatever thing I want, right? And I see them take the different ingredients, the milk and then the coffee and whatever. At what point are they collecting the semen? Where, when are they inserting it in my drink? Oh, it's already in the process. It's already in the pipeline. And by the way, <laughs> Starbucks has already have just introduced a flat white uh, drink, latte or mocha. I'm not sure which it is. That's a cover for semen, right? It, it is eerily, uh, it is as if they're almost mocking me. Like they're saying, la ha 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 ha, we'll show you that we're doing it. And the stupid Starbucks audience of, of patronage doesn't have enough sense to believe you, Manning. We'll actually put it, we'll hide it in plain sight. I mean, this is absolutely incredible what Starbucks is doing because they recognize their audience and their patronage uh, are just a bunch of idiots who will drink it no matter what's in it. They drink it with cyanide in it. Well, listen, the the gay semen and coffee aside, I think that there's no question that that the issue of homosexuality is a really important one to you. And I think that you you admitted in an interview with uh, Jenk and Anna over at the Young Turks that at one point you yourself were tempted by what you call the gay lifestyle. What tell us about that? I don't know about the gay lifestyle. That's an addition. I was in prison in my early 20s. And yes, I was tempted uh, to engage in a sexual intercourse with a, an, a, a sodomite. No doubt about it. Yeah, I did. I didn't do it. And thank God that, uh, that Jink and Anna had the integrity to publish the fact that I said I was tempted, but I didn't yield to temptation. Listen, I thought about at one point in time while I was in prison of committing suicide. I didn't do that either. But I was tempted. But what so what were your temptations uh, brought on by? In other words, you were you're in prison. You considered yourself, I assume, a heterosexual male. And what happened that made you say, maybe I'll have the gay gay intercourse? Been a long time without a woman. That's what it was. It was a long time without a woman. And, uh, you know, just watching it go on and, and seeing other people do it. And I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe I will. I, you know, I didn't, but I thought about it. It had been a long stretch without a woman. But and in the can, situation you were in, it struck you as an idea that might have been pleasurable. Yeah, I did. No, I thought it, you could, I don't know if it's something that I would be proud of in that regard, pleasurable. But in terms of sensations of the flesh, no doubt about it. That was the only reason I would consider it sensation of the flesh. But I would not have been proud of it. I can tell you that. You I'm know, glad uh, I Pastor Manning, I've spoken over the years to many uh, individuals who condemn homosexuality uh, to varying degrees, you know, similar to the way you do, including, uh, for example, Dr. Paul Cameron. And many of them have admitted to having had, I guess, what we could call colloquially gay temptations. Right. What, do, what do you think of the fact that there are so many outspoken anti-gay activists who end up being gay? Steve Wiles, 
George Reekers and Ted Haggard and Pastor Eddie Long. I don't know if that's someone that you saw in the kind of pastoring world. Troy King and Glenn Murphy Jr. Why do you think that there's this path that has existed in, in several dozen of these individuals who are publicly very anti gay activists? And then it turns out they themselves are gay. Well, you know, not every person who's anti-gay has been gay or is gay themselves. Of course. I, I think we need to understand, be clear about that. But the other thing I think, this old adage in the preaching industry, if you will, that one of the hardest preachers is someone who was either a former drug addict or a former criminal or one who really was at the pit of hell living an awful life. That person usually preaches the hardest against the things that they themselves used to be. Hence, you're looking at one. I mean, I, I lived a pretty wretched life for a brief period of time. And I suppose that the reason why I preach so hard is to warn people, don't go down the road of hurt and destruction that I went down. Don't go down that road. But, but isn't the that the opposite path, though? Because with these individuals, they were first doing the anti-gay preaching well, and then, then they, they stopped and it turned out that they were gay. Eddie Long and Ted Haggers were nothing but outright hypocrites. Uh, and, and that needs to be clear. They were flat out hypocrites because while, the, while they were preaching against it, they were doing the very thing that they said was wrong. What a hypocrite. But then you got a lot of pastors like that. Yes, there are lots of pastors who are hypocrites. Hey, last thing I want to touch on. You've said that both George W. Bush and his father had anal sex with 100 men. How do you know that? because they are part of the well-known fraternal group out of Yale University known as Skull and Bones. And it's public knowledge that the Skull and Bones organization, in order to be initiated, first of all, you had to lie in a casket and let men urinate on you. And then a part of the process, you had to stand in a circular, if you will, masturbation squad to be a part of Skull and Bones. And then you also had to be penetrated by the elder persons in Skull and Bone. Everybody knows this as public knowledge. And George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. are bona fide members of Skull and Bones. That means they have been penetrated by at least 100 men in their anus area. And how do you know that it's 100? Might it have been 95? Yeah, well, it could have been, could have been less, but generally that's the number that kind of gets the attention of everybody. And if it could have been fewer, it could have been none also, right? No, it could not have been none. It could not have been none, no. And because Skull and Bones will not accept you without that practice, it's hideous. But that's what they do. That's what these fraternities do. Some do even worse than that. But yes, George Bush has been penetrated by other men and has also been doused in semen of other men while he lie in a casket other men have uh, masturbated in his face. Sounds like quite an evening. Hey, just out of curiosity, how many people go to your church for a typical sermon? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. How many people attend a typical sermon at your church? Why do you want to know that? I'm just curious what the scene is like up there. What the semen is like? No, no, no. I'm not, what the scene is like. What's it like to attend? Oh, it's an extraordinary scene. I'd invite you to come. One of the more extraordinary experiences that anybody can ever have at any time. It's a wonderful experience. You know, most people who come to our church uh, find it the most unusual, welcoming, warm place where people are genuine. The spirit of God is present, the power of God. Most people declare they've never experienced anything like what they experienced at our church. And I invite you to come. No, I have, I have no question that it would be a unique and singular experience, but I'm just trying to find out, would it be a congregation of 10 or, or 100 or 1,000? What would I expect? Oh, it could be a congregation of 20,000, depending on the time in which we're preaching. So you're saying sometimes you get 20,000 people at your church in Harlem. And sometimes it could be more than that. Incredible, incredible. And that, that certainly is, seems to be a story that has been missed by uh, the corporate media. Let me remind the audience we've been speaking with Pastor James David Manning, chief pastor of the Atla World Missionary Church, just a few miles from us in Harlem, uh, it's truly been an incredible experience, Pastor. I appreciate you joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Ring thank again, if you will. I'll keep the light on for you. Thank you.